<laughs> okay, so let's uh, talk about how to make a tree or how to do it. And the first thing then is basically to do to do this, we ca somehow need a distance matrix. We somehow need a distance with different types and do that. And then we, then we need uh, a way to put these distances together. So we start with distances. So you have, if you have four different genes, four different species, whatever you call them, and then you have, or we always have a distance between each pair of these. And ideally, these distances should be added, additive. So basically, it means that every distance in a tree like this fits a single, uh, says that a single tree can explain all these distances. So between A and B, it is 6, so it's an 8 here, 2, 3 is 5, plus 6, this, this is 6. Between A and C, it is uh, 7, so you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And A to D, it's uh, 14, so you have more all the way up here, which is 8, and all down there is 6, so 14. So every pair will be that. Uh, So that's of course you will have that ideally. If, you, if even even nicer would be of course if there were all these were at the same time because these all exist today. Then they call the ultimate altermetric matrices. So really you have A B C D a perfect clock like that. It means that evolution is happening at the same speed at the same time in every branch. So. The way to do it, of course, is to kind of obviously, obviously called by neighbor joining or some other method. You basically find the closest pair first and you add them together. So, and then, so if you have a matrix, this does matrix look like this A, B, C, D, E, F. You have these distances, and of course, you have zero in the diagonal. The closest case here is A and D. So you take the closest one is A and D. So you put them together and you create new. new, new a new node, V in this case, that is has a joint measure A and D, and you replace all the distances to V here, well, so to D and A, from all the B, C, D, B, C and E, and F, with uh, and the average distance to A and D. So the distance from C to A is 8, and from C to D is also 8. So the average distance between C and V should also be 8, etc. So you can do that, and you get a tree that looks like this. And now we find a new closeness distance again, which is 2 in this case, which is between E and V. So you add that to your tree, and you get another position here with W. And you do find replace the V and the E with W. So you have B, C, F, and W. And you take average distances and you get a, an up here. You get an F. B being closest to F in this case. So now you have basically two separate trees here. You have B, F, and you have A, D, E. And, you, and your uh, mate is. Consists of C, you still haven't taken care of, and W and X. And then you have CWX, and in this case, if you find that W and X are closest to each other, and C is the outlier, mm. so you merge W and X to a Y, and uh, you try to match, and you, then you take the average of this one, and you have then a C, which is left there, and the C is an outlier out here. And you have a cell up there. So, and somehow it's a bit similar to when we, when we, when we did multiple sequence alignments. You start to close ones and add them together. And basically, as long as you just have these distance matrices, you can do this. It's not rather fast. Uh, and uh, there are other methods that are similar using neighbor joining. When this is. Uh, uh, mm. 
But uh, uh, but but there are also non fundamental different methods when you want to explain uh, when you also want to actually if you, if you instead instead of using just the distances you actually want to calculate the minimal number of chains. You want to have a tree and you want to test the tree how good it is and then you want to calculate what happens in every position of the tree. So you assume that you have these genomes, these genes, whatever you call them, and you have these species, alpha, beta, delta, delta, gamma, delta. And then you start with the tree that you maybe get a neighbor, you only get some other, other method. And you want to see what, what has happened in this tree. So you have alpha, beta, gamma, alpha, delta, gamma, beta, epsilon. And you take each position in your sequence here, say what was it up here, what was the original sequence here. So you take position 1, and you see that it could either be T and C. So you have basically T, delta is also T, gamma is also T, beta is C, and epsilon is C. So you basically have a tree that looks like that. So you have this part is C, and this part is T. So that means that the minimum number of mutations that can explain this tree is basically a mutation here or a mutation there. And so this is the most partial one of states for site one. For site two, you can do the same thing. But here you can't explain you can't explain this tree uh, with only single mutation, you need to have two. You can be here, here, here. So because you have C in this position, in these two positions, and A in the other things. So you can either have one mutation here, one mutation there, or uh, two mutations there, or one there, one there, or one there, one there. They all, all are two mutations that are equally likely, equally possible. And you go on and do the same thing for size 3, and size 4 and 5, and you end up with that, and 6, you end up with this. So, so in, in, in general, you could say that this tree could be explained by 9 mutations. Then you can try another tree. So you can basically say, what happens if I move this one here? Or I, I move them around. So is that three better three or not a better three? So I can, then I can just basically iterate to simulate <coughs> simulate through all the possible trees, and then I can find the best possible tree this way. So it was more time to but I really take into every step of mutation and everything, everything, every single step. And maybe I also want to take into the branch lengths here in this tree, so maybe it's more likely to happen in long branch lengths to have mutations and in short branch lengths, etc. So I can, I can do different. I can, I can move this up and down in different positions, etc. So I I can this way actually check really in a sequence alignment and find the best possible solutions. So this also makes it for time consuming. So there are the best methods of something using similar to Postman, but using a maximum likelihood me method describing it. But they are, if you have more than 10 or 100 uh, genes, it gets hard to do it. But neighbor joining you can easily do for quite many genes. But there are, there are a number of problems, they're not always as accurate, particularly if you have long branches. Okay, so then I thought we should talk about. So, what have we learned? from evolution. Now we switch to more biology part of things. So what have we learned? Well, life started about 4 billion, 5 billion years, 4 billion years ago. So quite early in Earth's history. That's the thing, everything, everything in here life started. How is a bit unclear, but there are at least some ideas. Photosynthesis was very rapid. So basically, you can basically get energy. It is believed that something like a couple of billion years ago, there was a last universal common ancestor. So that means that that was the last ancestor of all organisms on Earth. After that time, there are three distinct kingdoms of life. I'll come back to that in a second. But you have the 
bacteria and the eukaryotes, but you also have the archaea. How these are related is a big discussion, but that's, um, they are, it's, far, it's clear that there are three dis different distinct kingdoms of life. And basically then you had a big explosion half a billion years ago when you started getting a multicellular organism and plants and animals etc. Or animals later, but... And then the basic big thing was happened a few hundred million years ago when you had the rise of oxygen. So the early life, at least one theory, is basically that you happened in some kind of wells that were heated and there a lot of chemistry, maybe there things coming from, uh, from asteroids, who knows. But somehow you have started some self-replicating the RNA. The idea that it should be RNA is mainly from a practical point of view, because RNA is the only molecule that can both be replicated, so it can copy itself, but also be catalytic. DNA is not very catalytic. But uh, it's, and the proteins are not, of course, very complicated. But somehow, we went then from an RNA word that could generate some membranes or something, like, like enclosures at least, to a protein word. You have an RNA genome and you have maybe, the, but somehow you started making proteins. And really, how a protein factory could evolve from an old RNA word is, is, of course, hard to understand. But of course, we know that the ribosome is mainly an RNA molecule. Some of the early lives was an idea that you can actually generate amino acids and nucleotides maybe from just simple chemistry by using a lot of charges and a lot of oceans. Uh, water and uh, some uh, ammonium and other factors, but there are also evidence that you can find in amino acids on the, on um, meteorites and so on. So it's not clear where things started from. And as I said here, there are three kingdoms of life. So you have eukaryotes and bacteria. That's everybody knew for a long time ago. A long time. Basically, the, the organisms that have a nucleus and the organisms that do not have a nucleus. But then in the early 70s, I think, when people studied, um, I think it was the 16S ribosomal uh, RNA, uh, it was very clear from phylogeny studies that you had actually a third group. And, it, and these were found in. Uh, this strange bacteria that was living in very hot uh, wells or in sulfur mines on. And the idea was, or the thought, was that these, these uh, organisms were living in, su in some kind of uh, 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 origin of uh, I mean, some, some, some environment that, that looked like the very, very early Earth, like something that could resemble early Earth. So that, 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 and also, these organisms looked very simple. They didn't have a nucleus, so they, didn't have a, they looked quite small and so on. So the idea was, in the beginning, that they were kind of archaeal, so original uh, species that existed a long time before everything else. But that is not really true, because they really are just different in uh, the way the, from the eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And it's actually quite a big discussion, really, which of these three groups are, are closest to each other. If the archaea are closest to the eukaryotes or closest to the prokaryotes. Mm. And it's pro it probably answers that are some parts of the genomes that are most close to each other. So it probably was like, there are some parts of the... You can separate them by, for instance, the fundamental... The, um, the, the, the transcription machinery are quite distinct in all three cases, but you can also separate them. By, but there are some parts that are more archaea, eukaryotes more similar, and other parts archaea more similar to prokaryotes. So clearly, we'll call it a mix of several genomes at the beginning. So, but this was a, one of the first examples of really a phylogenetic tree told you something new about life. Otherwise, you would really think that it was a, another type of bacteria. But they are clearly distinct from both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Another example was actually, if you looked at the giant panda. panda. So, is the panda, the giant panda, is it a raccoon or is it a bear? <laughs> That's a big question. It's 
talk about Chinese mythology. We know, all know why it's black and white, because it used to be white, but then there was some little girl that went out the forest and was killed by the um, tiger or some other or some, and then the panda was so sad, so they were putting all black or putting more clay on them. I don't think that's the evolution of evidence for that, but the, we could study if it's a bear or a raccoon. And why do, why do you think it, well, it looks like a bear? But one thing the bears do is that they hibernate, and pandas do not. And also bears eat are uh, omnivores, and pandas only eat uh, bamboo. Uh, so they are so, uh, so not obvious, but okay. Uh, so in to, to solve this in 1985, Stephen O'Brien and colleagues tried to analyze the genomes, or actually not the genomes, but this DNA sequence of probably 16 S RNA, but I'm sure. And they come up with this nice little tree. Well, you have the brown bear, you have the polar bear, black bear, which is a smaller bear, some kind of spectacle bear, I don't know where they already lives, and then there the panda, and then the raccoon and the red panda, or well, the red panda is just a raccoon, or a clear separate. So you can see really, sure, it is a bear, it's much more similar to the bears and the raccoons, but it's also a very you know, ancient, ancient ancestor of or relative to all other bears. So it really they estimated the age here by using some, some kind of molecular clock. You see, it's all other bears are much more closely related to each other. So it's, it's an ancient replicate. How do they estimate the age? So age, what you do is normally, you, you, and there are, there are some genes that you assume has a linear mutation rate, but it's a lot of concern. And then you need some some kind of fossil evidence, some other evidence to, to, to calibrate it, because of course mutation rates in every gene is different. So if, but, and it's not, it's not true that it's linear either, but, but they are, they have histones that are very slowly evolving. It depends what, what time range you're looking at. But if, if, so you have, uh, I think 16 S RNA is quite good, so it's quite linear. Right? So you can just count the number of mutations. There are more things that mutate back, but you can, you can, you can so then, then you know that, okay, we know from some other evidence maybe that these two are separated by, 15 million, 35 million years, because you maybe have a fossil evidence on that, and then you're just calibrated by that. So, so we know something lived like 50 million years ago, and their RNA looked like this, and now we, if something that comes from that... Then you have like 252 mutations, think of, yeah. and then you have 125 yeah. separated, separated, uh, separated uh, 25 million years ago. Then. So then that's, <coughs> I mean, we go back, we'll come back to the human story, we'll, we'll, there's a lot of uh, clock things there, but then it's much closer to it easier, because you can really, really look. Uh, and it certainly depends on what, what time range you're looking at. I mean, if you look at relationships between uh, I mean, short times, you can just look at the non cooling regions, because they are, of course, rather linear mutation right there. And, but of course, if you want to look at really long time ranges, you need to have things that are conserved, in them, but they still have some mutations. So you have the right, right time mutations. If it's completely conserved, you won't see anything. If it's mutating too fast, you will not see anything at all. Alright, so I'll uh, keep story from here again. So this is actually the background. It was called Bose in 77, George. He defined it, basically found this uh, Archaea sequences and they used the 16S ribosomal RNA and made trees of it and then they end up with a tree that looked like that. Yeah. And the, this tree is very, I mean, it's discussed. But it's very, very clear that there's three distinct groups. But exactly when and how this universal common ancestor looks like is not obvious. It was two or one billion years ago, it's hard to say. And it was clearly, it depends very much. So when you make this tree, it often depends on exactly what genes you use and uh, what groups you do with that. But we don't care so much about it. We basically care about ourselves. We don't care about the key, I'm quite boring. But of course, we care about ourselves. We care about, particularly like everything else, we care who has sex with whom in the history of ourselves. It's like that, that's why we, why we do genomics. Uh, so, can we do this? So, so, uh, so, we actually learn a lot from, of course, we know from the last 100 or 150 years of uh, fossil hunting, we know we learn a lot about human evolution. From, uh, but. Uh, well, it's not obvious without genomics what is the closest relative to us. So the closest relative alive is, well, certainly the primate is obvious, but if it was chimpanzees or gorillas, it's not obvious. And we know that it's particularly these Neanderthals, which is the closest, live, closest 
dead relative to us? How, how related is it how, when it uh, appears? And particularly, how is our relationship to monkeys? And where did, where did, we, where did we human species originate? And, where, and, and when? And how close related are we? Are we distinct races or not? So, uh, well, this is probably a very short thing. Basically, the last common ancestor of, of all the primates are, not all primates, but the, but the gorillas, chimpanzees, and, and, and humans are order 8 million years ago. And it's very clear from genetic evidence that chimpanzees are closer to humans than the gorillas. It's actually the case that Gorilla, <coughs> gorilla is the outlier. So really, chimpanzees and, and the humans are are uh, are cousins, and the gorillas are a bit more further cousins. And you then you probably at least we have a lot of evidence for a lot of uh, fossil evidence for extinct species here. All these uh, fossils that we found all over the world, basically not so much in America, maybe but in the rest of the world. Not in Antarctica either. Uh, and then the chimpanzees are basically two groups or three groups, and then you have bottom most of the subspecies of chimpanzees. And then you have us here. And then the last common answer that we found fossil evidence for was alive was maybe 40,000 years ago, it was, was Neanderthals. So, a few things that from fossil evidence uh, evolved here was the um, a key thing is actually when we start walking two feet. So these, these are one of the distinct features that are separating us from uh, gorillas and chimpanzees. My gorillas and both chimpanzees can stand on two feet, they can stand up, but really they, they haven't learned the anatomy for doing it very efficiently. And then there are other things that happen later, when you have smaller teeth, we're not very good at biting. So that first will indicate a change in diet, you eat different things. Uh, we are not as robust, we can become a bit weaker. And of course, for the last two million years or so on, this brain size has increased. And of course, there are some, some uh, ideas about symbolic expression for the last 50,000 years or so. So, actually, this we can watch. This you can watch. You can get homework to watch this yourself. It's a very good, much better than I can tell it, a story about. Uh, let me ask. Okay. Let me ask, say hi to my daughter. Hey. Hey. So you shouldn't have your phone on, uh, but they call again if you don't answer. So uh, this is Santa Pabo, so a Swedish uh, geneticist, works in Germany, and he will tell you about a story about how relationships are between humans and Neanderthals. But just a short, short uh, cut his conclusions. So basically, the idea is here: what to do is to look at genetic variation in, in the common uh, uh, human in, in, in between people and from that you can actually reproduce genetic variation so one thing that is obvious is that the genetic variation is quite low so basically we are all quite similar that means that we are although we are 10 billion people or 8 billion people we are a, a, a young species, so the net variation is much bigger than many other animals. And uh, so it probably should look something like that. So you have humans' variation is like that, and but the chimpanzees, the bonobos are variation like that, and gorillas are variation like that. So gorillas and chimpanzees are much older species than we are. So that means that sometime in the evolution towards humans, all our relatives died and we were as a small, small group. Of course, not a single person or, or a single couple, but it was a small group of maybe thousands of individuals or something, but it was a small group. And, were, and it was quite recent. And all others died out. And compared to Shippasim or, or Gorillas, they are 
has been for a much longer time been evolving and being more dis different. So the four variation means that it's uh, very recent and then uh, or alternative that has been a very very strong selection of, of like uh, some features that are just in small population. Okay. And of course, you have also suggest uh, also generation time matches and things less. But it's but in general, of course, it's very quite recent. So basically, uh, if you put some time on it, you end up with a few hundred thousand years. And of course, we know that uh, we are all. No, we are not the same species. We can all have children with each other. And it's not like uh, uh, a horse and a donkey who will not have fertile children. Uh, and it's a continuum. This is basically, you can't find a single mutation that is unique for a population on Earth. So there is not a single mutation that you can explain. If you have this one, you're from Africa, or this one, you're from America. So this is continuous. It's always a mix of things. On the other hand, it's not that difficult to see if people are from different places. So you can look at skin colors, which is the obvious thing we see, at least the pale people that we are, see the big different skin colors. And you can have a quite nice, it's also a continuum, but it's nice. You would never guess that someone from the Netherlands is from Shopee, wherever that is in Africa somewhere, because they're much darker. It's no overlap at all. And certainly, but the Shopee and the Masua are overlap, but they are just with skin color. So certainly there are, there are distinct features of different people in different regions. Another thing you notice if you do this is that, it, is that you actually have much larger genetic diversity in, um, in Africa than anywhere else. Uh, so if you take two random African people, they are much more diverse than if you take anyone from Africa, outside Africa, to anyone else outside Africa. So take a, someone from Spain and someone from southern Chile, from, or Native American, or the Chinese. They are these three groups are much more similar to each other than two random Africans are not next to each other. So that means indicates was that the Africa population has been evolving for much longer time. And particularly, of course, you do these studies, you, you try to take the, the native uh, populations and no, 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 Aboriginal population, no, no, not the ones that are traveling and moving around, lost a few hundred years. So, of course, <laughs> a black American is, of course, because it is more simple than African than to a Native American. Uh, so, you can do that, and in particular, but what you can look at, you can look at frequencies. So, certainly there are positions in the genome that are more frequent in some populations than others. If you, and if you add this up, it's quite easy to m tell what your region is from, unless you're, if you not have been too mixed to different things. But really, if you have been, you have been living in the same part of the world for the last 20 generations, it's quite easy to pinpoint you. So this is what, what you can do in your next thing. Not, not that a single mutation, but a combination of maybe some thousand mutations really tell you that you are most likely, your ancestors are, have been most likely living in Northern Europe for the last 100 years. You could even do it, I think even the, in the UK, there was studies, you could even always pinpoint for the people, some people down to the village. They've been living in this village for the last 100 years. But it also all depends that you haven't been moving around too much lately. So you can do that, and you can basically calculate that, and, you can, and from that you can actually reconstruct the path that the human has spread over the world. And put the numbers in it. So the idea was is that somehow, a few hundred thousand years ago, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, there was population was living here, somewhere in Africa. And then it started spreading out in Africa, like that. And then maybe slightly less than 100,000 years ago, we moved out of Africa into the, um, the earliest evidence are basically in, well, in the Israel, the region, like in the Middle East. 
and then maybe some evidence that there is even another population going here to Mars' southern rapid event, and then spread out all the way here, and further down to Africa, and then the rest of Europe, the rest of... Right. And until we got back here, <laughs> finally got to Sweden. <laughs> and it is cold and icy. So, so the idea is like somehow we know that the lo last part of was we spread over the North Americas, and that was probably 15,000 years ago. So it was, that was the time when it was cold enough so you can walk over the Bering uh, Lake. And what Sander Pebble was going to talk about was, which I actually don't have the slides for here, maybe I have another one. Um, and I think I might have it there. Mm -hmm. What's this part? So, so that's uh, it's basically. What has happened with the Neanderthals, or the, or the discovered Neanderthals? The Neanderthals was f found 150 years ago in Germany, in the Neanderthal. And they clearly are they're the most. I mean, the, the human most close relative to us have been found as a fossil. And they are. <coughs> see, the fossil evidence say they have existed for about half a million years in Europe and West Asia. They have not been found outside Europe and West Asia, basically some region here, or maybe uh, Middle East. And, uh, and uh, the last evidence from the North in the order of 30,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. And they are very similar to us. They are slightly different, but they are, at least bones, look, they look rather similar. You can find differences if you go into details, probably slightly shorter. Uh, there are differences here in like some uh, large in the patellas and in the fingers are slightly different. They're probably a bit more thicker about us, but they're not that different. And uh, mm. this one doesn't matter me. This one I'm not going to go So what Van der Pepper did, other people did, or he, he, well, his research group did, he said they took bones from a number of different spaces, the Norse ones we'll talk about later, but, um, and then they, they extracted the sequence from this. And this is really hard work. But the problem with when you do this work is that it's very easy to get it contaminated with human sequences. And they're, of course, they're very, very similar. They're only half a million years separated. If you, ta if you take an old sample from a, Mammut, it's quite easy to, to know because if you got something, if something looks like a human sequence in there, you know it's wrong. But if it looks like an elephant, you're not very likely that the elephant has contaminated it. So, by default, if you, if you have to be very, very careful when you do the sampling and you have to do tests and two different things like that. So, the first, so they basically did that. The first they did on mitochondrial RNA, DNA and then, you, and then they found basically the full genome. And the big surprise was, as we always talk about who had sex with whom. So basically, if you look at parts um, of the genome, right, that's not the best slide. Uh, right here, basically, is that they have, uh, uh, we do have some Neanderthal DNA in us. So basically, there's some parts of the DNA. So basically, what they do is that they took human genomes from different parts of the world compared to the Neanderthal genome. And what you do find is that if the Neanderthal was completely unrelated to all human genomes, it would be equal, it would be equally likely to be uh, that any part would be similar to the Neanderthal genome as it would be to um, independent of where you come from the world. Because sometimes just by random, you're going to have mutations, you're going to so a part going to look more like the Neanderthal than the, some other parts of the human genome. So basically, every, every position in the genome, you have three bases. You have human one, and human two, and the Neanderthal. So for some, and you can have AAT, sometimes. In most cases, the Neanderthal is going to, most of it is the same, but in some cases, it's going to be some mutations. 
Otherwise, it can also be cases where it happens like that. That's because it's random, there are variations that are random between different, between different individuals. But if it was so that all these genes, I mean, all the Neanderthals was completely separate, the Neanderthals would be, uh, every human genome would be equally, like, equally similar to the Neanderthal genome. But it, that's not the case. What they found was that all the uh, Neanderthal genome I mean, the, 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 the genes, all the genes that were uh, from outside Africa were more similar to the Neanderthal genomes than all the genes that were from inside Africa. So then you can do, do mathematical modeling, <coughs> means uh, in the order of a few percentage of the Neanderthal genome, or, or our genome that we draw outside Africa, seems to come from Neanderthals. So that was the beginning of the story. So they basically found uh, so basically there was there was evidence that there has been some kind of interbreeding and there's some different theories, but in general the agreement is that sometime quite recently after humans left Af the modern humans left Africa, there was some interbreeding and a few percentage of the genome comes from that. There are even some indications that, that these genes might have some advantage for cold and so on, but that's you know, or for light skin color or for drinking milk or something like that, but it's not really clear. But then the other story was actually when they went to a place in Siberia called the Noseva, and there's a cave there, and they found a small, small part of a pinky finger, so like a small bone. Then it could be Neanderthal or human, and they didn't really know. But, if, but it was, they found it was like 40,000 years, something like that, or 30,000 years ago. And it was from a child. And uh, They then started sequencing this one, and they got a very good sequence of it. And they realized that it was not human, not Neanderthal. It was clearly a distinct group, slightly more similar to Neanderthal than humans, but clearly distinct, probably for many hundred thousand years from Neanderthals. Uh, and they then found... Okay. They then they, 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 they found... That was the same question there. Is there any part of the populations in the world that are more similar to this than other parts of the human population? And they found a small group in uh, Papua New Guinea, which is down here somewhere, small island of, of Aborigines there, that had a significant 7-8% of the genome that appeared to come from this, the North of one's Siberian thing here. And you never thought that in, in, in so of course, the, the, the idea is that, but no, only, only from this small group here, nothing else from China or anything like that, nothing else like that. So the, so the idea that the only explanation they could have is that when the human, so that this, the Northern group was spread out all over Africa, all over Asia, but when the human, modern humans entered here and walked down to here, here there was some interbreeding, and the, this population then survived in these small islands here. And then later, when the rest, it must have been later phase when the European uh, or the Middle Eastern uh, humans conquered Asia. There was no interbreeding of this. At least there was no, no significant amount of interbreeding. So they really, also sec so this population was really separate from all the others. And those my eyesight islands. And most likely, there are many other of these events that happen. So if you go to Africa, of course, you, the problem is like in Africa, if you haven't found any really Neanderthal or any type of bones from, uh, well, from, from that close relative to us. But it's not unlikely that there are, and there's been interbreeding there between different parts of Africans and us. But it's just that in many, to, for these fragments of these bones to be conserved in, that you, 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 it's slightly worse actually if you have hot temperatures, so it's like the most de 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 degraded faster. So you probably have, but maybe I haven't found them yet. So clearly it seems to be the number of cases in the last few hundred thousand years that we have had some small contribution of earlier humanine uh, genomes into our genomes. And that's, uh, so far we only know about two of these, but it's not unlikely to be in Africa anymore. 
So, and uh, there are also further studies when people actually use this type of genome for looking at how the Indo Europeans move to Europe and uh, if the hunter gatherers come first, so once you have, you have different old species, you look at old human animals. So, you have learned a lot about human history from old, well, from population of the humans today and also from old uh, bones that were found on the ground. So, I, I suggest that you, when you have a time, you go to this YouTube page and look at Santa Peppa's movie. It's really good. Okay.